Welcome to Extreme Life Season 2, coming to you tonight from Bangkok in Thailand. I have with me tonight uh, Thin Sa Shun Lai. She's from Myanmar, and she's a youth activist and campaigner. Uh, Thin uh, Shun Lai, welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Thank so you. you grew up in Myanmar under full military rule, but you have an interesting story to tell because you actually were part of that very dominant community at that time. So can you tell me a little bit about how it was growing up in a military compound in Myanmar? Um, so I was raised in a military compound in the, where the country was under the military rule. And so we, being inside the military compound, you are, you are different. You are different and you look differently to the other people, especially on the civilians. So we feel we are superior. We are capable of ruling the countries. And um, we are in the positions to, uh, to protect the countries from the other different outside feathers. That's how we learn about it. And what did you learn? I mean, there are, what, 135 ethnic groups in Myanmar. Did you learn about them? And if so, what did you learn about them when you were in this very protected, very, very prestigious world? So um, there are different types of ethnicity in the country, the bigger and the majority and the small minority groups as well. We learned that from the school textbook, but not by persons. The exposure to different cultural, different ethnicity in person was quite rare for us in the military as well as the Burmese Buddhist in the majority. I was just surrounded by only Burmese, only Buddhist. So we just learned that, but not understand. We don't understand them. And did you have any friends or did you have any contact with anyone from any other No, group? not really, because in military, you know, most of them what you will see are the people from the majority groups. When you are from the minority religions or from different ethnicity, then you will not be promoted. Uh, your rank will be lower than others and their discrimination is quite huge. Um, so that's how I, I was learning that, you know, Burmanizations, the we Burmese people um, were the ones who are leading the country. When you say Burmanization, that's the belief that the, the Buddhists are, are the best, the most capable to lead the country going forward, and that's the way that you grew up. Is that correct? So the ethnicity, uh, Burmese. So most of the leaders that we have known are all Burmese as well, the current leader as well. So we don't we don't imagine anyone from the major, uh, minority religions of different ethnicity to become a leader. So that's how we learned we we are supposed to be leaders. And also from the different um, school textbook, what you learn is just about the Buddhist Buddhist and also just about uh, Burmese people, Burmese leader, not from the other ethnic difference. Uh, other ethnicities. So at what point did you start thinking that maybe there was more to life than the military compound in which you grew up and maybe you needed to start investigating different parts of the country or different religions, different ethnicities? So that curiosity, so you can grow your curiosity and, uh, and uh, the, uh, inside the military compound when you ask something then you cannot get any questions, you are not supposed to ask any question but just to follow the rules and procedure and orders, that's how I, I was. So I asked questions, different critical questions, didn't get any answer, proper answer. So when I finished my high school and I can go out, I go out and meet different people from different ethnicity and some political prisoners, so why they were jailed, I was thinking they are just criminals. They were making the country to be, to be messy and violent. And I heard different stories. That's the point that changed my life. Story from different people. Listening their own story, personal reflection, made me go to, um, to become a moderate one. So when you were a teenager and you were finishing school, there was the Saffron Revolution. Is that right? Was that about the time that you were finishing school? I wasn't, yeah, grade 10. Uh, in, in 60, um, when I was 16. Have, um, maybe you could explain the Saffron Revolution a little bit and, and how it positioned, again, Buddhists to be quite, quite strong leaders in the country. Um, in 2007, many younger population, just like my age as well, become uh, also involved in the revolutions, going out on the street and also um, talking and talking and asking for justice and also for the democracy movement. It was started from a very small cost, uh, the petroleum, the rice uh, price of the petroleum, but it also asked for the bigger thing like democracy, election. So, uh, and also British men, they were also marching, uh, pray, uh, praying for the, the peace. Monks. And yes, the men were also leading that too. So it also inspired me, also asked a lot of questions to me, uh, to myself as well. Um, I also heard different stories from different people. Yeah. So the monks who were leading the protests during the Saffron Revolution, 
Um, how did that affect you when the military opened fire and many people were killed? What, what, how did that affect you? Because you were in this position whereby the military and Buddhism were hand in hand leading the country. Um, it was shocking. So I was thinking the leaders were um, very religious enough. They wouldn't shut them down, but they actually did. Um, they also oppressed the same you know, the same scale to other different ethnicity. So that also shocked me to realize how bad it is for someone, someone who has a red point and they, um, they will crush them down or right, regardless of religions or the race and the ethnicity. So I, you, I started hating the militarizations and the military regions since that time. Yeah. But you were still living at home with, yeah. within a military family yeah. and they didn't allow you to go to the protest, did they? No, they didn't allow me. So how did you hear about the protests? How did you hear the stories that were coming out? It was coming out um, on different uh, media and channels that I heard story, and also I also learned from different uh, relatives, and I called them, you know, so we heard different stories that something's happening, so we need to find out more. I need to find out more. And how did that provoke you then? What, how did you move forward with your activism from that point forward? So right after the several revolutions, I used I when I was joining the different club conversation club, I get uh, I, I I was meeting with different friends and they will share me their own stories and their struggles and that, that actually it was like gradual moment. Their story has shaped my life and I have to reevaluate my own values that I put on the military, also that I that the way I see it on the democratic movement and the protester, etc. and that's the way I was growing up myself to become an activist. Okay, and so moving forward again, we have the transition to democracy around 2011. So we have the, uh, the, the, the breakdown of total military rule, the handing over of power, or pa partially handing over of power, mm -hmm. um, and uh, an opening up at that point in time in Myanmar. And did you feel that there were did you feel very hopeful? In 2010, there was an elections, and I was quite hopeful. Yeah, there was there's gonna be a first ever government that we could elect with our own hand, and then I was also doing the voter education as well since that time. But it was not very good. I was an encouraged to do those kind of political affiliated wars, so that also raised a lot of questions. Why, um, as I learned, politics is of everybody text. Everybody tells that we have to do that politics to learn more about, to become a responsible, active, informed citizen. So I keep on doing, I keep on campaigning about it. Yeah. And what was the position at this point of the ethnic groups? And, and what, was, what, what was starting to happen behind the scenes? Was there fear that perhaps the ethnic groups would be starting to get too much power? So ethnic groups in that time, um, actually, they were suffering a lot. They were also impacting from, they got impacted from the civil wars. They keep going. In 2011, there was a regime civil war in Kachin State in different, in the northern part. And also in other different areas, there were small fights going on. So these things also um, create a lot of, you know, life, uh, become an IDPs. Uh, the education system, the transportation, even it was not that equal in the equal situations, you know, we got the, the, the regional states, we have different situations, yeah. So things were changing very, very quickly and one of the changes that really became apparent around that time was also the rise of Buddhist nationalist groups, hardline groups. Yeah. Can At you tell time, me how you first sort of became aware of these groups? So these groups um, rose and up uh, against, uh, through the social media especially, and they will campaigning to drive the Muslim people out of their homes and also ban their houses alive. So those kind of news also, you know, from different channel, TV channel and from media. So I, I was also from, uh, with the different friends as well, like Muslim friends. I was li listening to them, how their feelings. It was such a nightmare for us at the, at the time. We were young, but we were doing something, um, we wanted to do something good, like interfaith. We need to raise that awareness. In 2012, we were raising that, but it wasn't paying off when that broke out again in 2017. So we're talking about really some quite um, radical uh, Buddhist movements here, extreme movements that, uh, that seem to be able to, at this point in time, gain quite a strong uh, popularity. 
It, and it was widespread, wasn't it? Yeah, it spread out. Uh, because it's mostly Buddhist community um, is the majority, then it's easy to uh, reach out to them, this ideology, the extremism ideology. And it also, you know, um, came out in the beautiful names, like the protection of race and religions. I need to mention the name Mabada, especially Mabada. So they are the ones who um, spread out this extremism mindset to the younger population, also to the uh, Buddhist community. And during this period of political transition, how do you think they managed to really capture people's fears? Was there a fear that that somehow the Buddhists were going to lose their grip on power in Myanmar? What were they, what were they fearful of? Um, so Myanmar people normally we are quite fearful with different things because we, are, we were raised and, and are the military regions. We are um, in the oppressive regions and it's easy for us to get fear or something, losing a land, losing a religion, losing a uh, race. So I think they use that fear cut. They instill that fear for, you, if you don't do something, then you will lose, lose of your own religions. And another different religions like Muslims is, um, is influencing your own religions right now. And people get fear of it. People will uh, go into the actions, not only from wars, but also they took action as well. And how did the government react when these groups started to become very vocal and it very powerful? It wasn't satisfaction uh, for us, satisfactory for us. They were actually, we doubt they were also a part of it because the government, um, so they used that card, nationalism card, protecting the race and religions, and they play the games uh, politically, yeah. And you were saying before how widespread, how, how you knew people who had, who became part of or, or aligned with Mabata, mm. the extremist uh, Buddhist nationalist group, uh, and people who you perhaps grown up with, family members. What was it about them that, that drew drew people in? Um, it was about the kind of from different uh, Buddhist teachings, different uh, ceremonies um, in the names of Buddhism, in the name of peace, in the name of um, nationalism. They also compose sounds. They will also um, open up uh, schools to teach to the kids, especially to the kids, using different channels, in a media channel, installing this kind of hatred toward different religions. So they were, they were doing more than just religion. They were running social programs and education like, programs? Yeah, it's like education program, not only education program. I f we feel like it's institutionalized now. It's, become, it's growing, it's growing bigger and bigger and also stronger and stronger. So it's the time to add on it. And it's, extremism is not just a group of people or just, uh, just one group or one school. It's about the ideology. So we have to combat with the positive ideologies to combat this. So around this time as well, if we, yeah. we go back to 2010, 2011, um, it also coincided when Myanmar was opening up more to the, to the world, yeah. um, the influx of technology and mobile phone technology and social media. It all came in at once, didn't it? Was there some parallel there between what was going on with the extremist movements and the opening up uh, of the market for technology, um, uh, ownership of, of cell phones, yeah. uh, access to social media? So it wasn't even a decade now we have uh, access to the internet. It was like, boom. First, we just have a device, but there is no ways how to use it. There is no um, educations how to utilize these mobile devices for the better good of ourselves. So it just came in as a device. People misuse it, and some people might be using that uh, to get something out of their interest for the political or for social abuse, uh, harassment. There are different forms of disadvantages of it right now. So these social media. Um, were playing a key role actually when there was a violence in 2012 as well as in 2017. The whole year, the whole time, it was kind of a tool for the extremists to use to spread out their strategies and their message. So you would have been a social media user at this time. Yeah. What kind of things did you notice coming in on your feeds, whether it be Twitter or Facebook or whatever? What kind of rhetoric messaging were you seeing? So there are different types of messages, but the, the only uh, common point is coming from extremists to protect their religions. It's the time for them to um, protect, also to prevent them from um, 
Muslim Muslimizations. I mean, coming out from different um, uh, different countries. So that's how that's how was it actually in the and it's a common point. But uh, most of the time, it was all about hate speech on towards different religions, different ethnicity. So it wasn't only Muslim being discriminated against. It also was. Uh, Christian and other different ethnicity. When you are different, when you are, when you believe in different sexual orientation, then also you are targeted. I also think this is also a result of without uh, critical knowledge, critical thinking in education. Also, we don't have digital literacy enough to educate the people how to use it, how to utilize, how to assess and review. So that's that's the result of all all the yeah. And do you think the the, the government uh, should have done more, or was it just too? overwhelming and too new and nobody really knew how to tackle this problem when it started? So the government wasn't even aware of that actually I was thinking because uh, there was only giving the devices to the public but there is no education followed by this. So the government needs to do more about it. I mean the current government as well and also the civil society responsible um, to give more awareness towards but we are we are we're not in the positions to educate the whole nations we need to the civil society need to be encouraged enough as well so if we we move forward to uh, the attacks that many people have um, said are in relation in some way to this uh, stirring up of ethnic hatred mm -hmm. um, we're now what, one year after uh, hundreds of thousands of Rohingya were, were forcibly removed and had to uh, rebase themselves in Bangladesh. Um, what are the feelings now in Myanmar uh, towards the Rohingya people? So today, uh, this, this month, August, has marked one year after that exodus. Um, so after one year, we didn't have much space to speak up openly about it yet. Um, but also, even the name Rohingya was not even allowed by the government, it's not used. And also, it's still very sensitive. There are, there are different progress happening in the western part of the country, but still, they are quite controversial. Only a few tech academic was saying about them, and also activists and human rights activists were not doing enough actions to um, protect from doing happening this as well. So we are also feeling desperate with what had happened that time. Also right now, um, uh, the feelings, the people still hate Rohingya, still they don't agree with uh, what they've been asking. I feel there is a need to have a questions, a clear question from different side. Also, these questions need to be answered. They all should meet up and dialogue together for a better future because they, could, they, they will have to live together for a long time when they relocate back in their own place. Are you optimistic though? Because when we were talking before, you were saying that uh, during uh, the exodus of the Rohingya, as you were, you were saying, you really noticed a lot of people who you knew from civil society, all of a sudden they, they, they had some views that were very divergent from yours. Yes, so civil society member, um, we, feel like, we feel like we're not that much strong and principled. The civil society in Myanmar is quite young. For me, it was it was old, but it was old since long time ago. But mostly on the humanitarian response and social activities, but not on the political, but not on the human rights. So human rights become a new actually. It was a new uh, concept for us. The extremism as well the same. The new concept. We don't have even uh, that clear definition on it too in Burmese. Um, so. So when that happened, people are quite confused with where to stand. Um, there is a, a bigger propaganda coming out to be against uh, Rohingya. At the same time, you are standing on the human rights. So people get confused. Sometimes they just stand on the, they just stand one side against their own principle. So that's how we experience that. Yeah. W were you surprised by that? Yeah, I was surprised. Surprise, surprise, and also shock, also desperate and fed up since that time. And like more around three months, we we were debating, we were arguing, we were discussing that, and we are like divided as well since that time. Even among the activists and civil society, we have different perception on this. Did you find that people who you had known for a long time, who you thought had been working in the humanitarian context or for human rights, that mm -hmm they just didn't really um, 
believe in what they were doing or was it more, more complicated than that? It was sad actually. Um, it was sad to see that. They were, they were standing on the human rights ground but at the same time, the, the human rights they believe in has some exception. Exceptions, not for them, not for this. I feel there's a need for the compassion and empathetic, empathetic uh, join and also loving kindness toward different people. Also, in, also they claim themselves as Buddhist, but we all have to share our um, loving kindness to every human, li every living things. So, so what sort of things were they doing or saying that made you feel that perhaps um, they really weren't uh, um, being very um, inclusive in terms of the way that they were responding? What, what sort of things happened that, that made you so disappointed? So they were saying hate speech, <laughs> hate speech, especially hate speech. People who had been human rights activists. Yeah, they also say hate speech. I think they might not have ideas for the hate speech as well at the same time. Um, he's saying hate speech and discriminatory words and also dangerous speech as well. And also the social influenza that they, was, they were saying that. I think they were fearful as well at the, at the same time. That fearful and the international community, the, 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 the coverage of this news uh, was biased uh, was by at the time like the also the Rakhine civilians the Rakhine people the other different ethnicity they also suffer they have to um, get out of their home as well so they were kind of biased reporting system they were so outrageous and they um, they also they take part in that hate speech um, you know uh, so the biased reporting you mean yeah. from from inside Myanmar or outside Myanmar which, which are you saying or there was just a different form of reporting? The way that the story was being reported outside Myanmar, it didn't feel it's like... It's different. It's different with the inside story as well. Um, but that does not mean that because the, uh, the outside, the outside um, journalists were not allowed to get in and explore and investigate things. So there were different stories. So why, why can't we just, you know, um, let them in and see the truth if there is true? We don't know what's happening in the ground actually that time. We were just saying based on our fear, based on our emotion, based on our perception. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't go to the point, actually. And what kind of things were coming out on social media at that time from perhaps some of the, the Buddhist nationalist groups, extremist groups? So at the time, of, of course, it was a huge uh, campaign by the extremist group against this. Also, they will, and we noticed that there are a group of people already trained just to spread this sentiments, just to spread this kind of hate speech. Um, they were systematically working on it. Um, I think that Rohingya case, that kind of violence was not that um, simple. Mm. It wasn't just it wasn't just um, ethnic issue. It wasn't just religious issue. It's also about the political as well. It's also about business as well. In what way? Yeah, business. There there could be some trading, um, like especially opium. You know the the drug and they were trading as well, and also there. Uh, right after that happened, there were uh, there were a business zone, you know, being being agreed between. Okay, so you're, you're talking about intra in small issues within Rakhine rather than the the exodus of hundreds of thousands of people. You're saying there there were other issues on the ground. Yes. Okay, but we don't know so much about those because people have not been able to report on them. Yeah. Is that correct? So if we move. Um, and have a look at what has happened in the past year in terms of Myanmar and your space to be able to, 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 to be an activist, to be outspoken uh, on human rights issues, on humanitarian issues, mm -hmm. on e ethnic issues. Um, where, where, are, where are you now? Are you able to operate freely? Do you have any threats against you? So since that time, uh, we were also campaigning the same for the peace and justice in Myanmar uh, from different costs. Um, but the civil society space for the political, our political space has been shrinking. And also the military was quite sensitive with, with the uh, activist uh, activities and our spoken words. They were suing the government, uh, they, was, they were charging the people, they were suing the people, the activists especially, and also the journalists. And so we organized like peaceful protests. Um, we also organize every year actually for the peace of Myanmar to stop civil war. So this year it was it wasn't that good. Like we were crashed down, and we are also there are also other different campaigner in different areas, and they were also charged like more than forty seven 
around 47 were charged, and some of them are charged by the military. So it was not a good time for us as well to campaign what we have been doing. Same thing, but it was not a good time. And you yourself were charged as well, weren't you? Yeah, I was, I was charged, yeah, by the government. And, and uh, you have to make appearance every week, is that correct? Yeah, you have court to. hearing every week. The other young activists as well, they, was, they were also being charged. And there are two, two journalists being also charged. And they are, if they get sentenced, they will be in jail for 30, 13 years. It was such a critical time as well for them. Okay, so where does that leave you now as an activist? Um, what can be done? What, what projects can you do? Who can you talk to? What, what groups can you bring together? What can you achieve with this political climate at the moment? So it was hard for the activists in Myanmar right now that because the government, current government has a full legitimacy behind the people. So if we go against, if we say something against the current government, then they are... Um, it will be quite hard for us. Then we will face another different fires with the pro and uh, pro pro government. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really important for all the activists to stay on ground, to stay on our own principle, and be morally strong at the same time, and stick on our own value. First, we need to have an own value first. Then stick on it. That's something that we have to do. And as a Buddhist. I'm a Buddhist as well. I think um, Buddha teaches us like to be kind and to be, you know, to give loving kindness to every human being. That if we, if we, if you broke the rules, then you're not, you're not, any, you're not a Buddhist anymore. So we need to keep on ourselves on the right track, on the eightfold part. Making shipa, we have like right to right mindfulness, right livelihood, right way of thinking, right intentions. We have to keep our kamas like. Uh, everything's related to what, what you think you become. So what you add, what you say, you will become an action, serious action for you. So I think it's, it's really important for us to keep ourselves moderate. At the same time, as I mentioned before, the digital literacy, the media literacy is truly important, it's really urgent. We haven't done it enough. Also, the institution was not that strong yet, a democratic institution. It was, it's a yen uh, democratic country. Also, the institutions are quite really weak. The strong institution only are the military and the Mabata, so the a, nationalist group. In, in a way, do you feel it's more difficult being an activist with this government than perhaps under military rule? Um, under military rule, it was clear that who is your enemy. Right now, your enemy is the military. Your enemy means the, the one that you have to fight for democracy. The, the military stay in power with 25% in the parliament. Also, they are ruling uh, three different important ministries. So you have to rule them out too at the same time. Um, but yeah, under the civilian government, it become, it become quite, you, if you put yourself in a dilemma becoming, becoming an activist. Um, to say this out or to understand the government, the government facing the struggle. It was such a huge dilemma for the activists. But I think if we are principled, then we will say anything. Whoever is ruling the country right now, we will say what we believe in, what is right and wrong. So do you feel safe being an activist? Not really, not now. Not really, not now. So we wish to have a safe space for the activists as well in Myanmar. Um, so when you campaign, especially for the politics, then um, then you are threatened. You can be threatened. You can be personally attacked by different uh, face of bias. Yeah. And have you received any threats or any kind of messages that make you worry? So when I stand up for the suffering of the Rohingya people, and also when I um, say something against the nationalist group, when I say something against the the ultra nationalism and the Buddhism, extreme Buddhism, or about even about the civil war. So recently, I have um, recently I'm charged by the government. At the same time, I was attacked by different military people as well, like pro military. They don't like we saying stop civil war. They were also misjudging us to become. Uh, we are like we are with the rebel group. We are with the arms group. We were saying for a peaceful nation, but when you are young and when you are a woman, it's easy for you to be targeted as well for the, yeah, for the personal attack and hate speech towards you. Shunlei, thank you for joining us. We're out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us tonight on our first episode of Series 2 of Extreme Lives. You can follow us on Facebook and on YouTube. Just look for Facebook Extreme Lives and YouTube Extreme Lives on our channel. Uh, next Tuesday, we will be coming from the Foreign Correspondents Club in Bangkok, uh, where we will be discussing extremism in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you very much, and good night from Bangkok. Thank you.